Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. I am Tyler Donahue. We have another loaded show in store for you right here on the Lions 24-7 podcast. Mark Brennan, Daniel Gallon, my colleagues from the site, hopping on in just a matter of minutes to break down some blue-white feedback and, and some takeaways from our experience in Beaver Stadium on Saturday. We've got to address the, the roster rebuild that basketball is going through right now. Some positive news on that front, but first and foremost, a ton happening on the recruiting trail right now for the Penn State Nittany Lions. We now have our third commitment in the books from the Penn State Blue-White Game Visitors List. Uh, just coming moments ago here on Tuesday afternoon from Donovan Harbor uh, out of Wisconsin, uh, joining the class of top 24-7 offensive linemen. And again, three guys who were in the in the bleachers at Beaver Stadium on Saturday are now in future plans as commitments. I think we'll continue to see that number grow days, weeks, months ahead as we continue to dissect the impact of these spring visits. And to do that right now is Tyler Calvaruzzo. And Tyler, we'll talk about some of those players who left on committed and remain on committed. But we got to begin with a trio of pledges that Penn State has picked up since Saturday afternoon and begin with the newest member of the bunch in Donovan Harbor. Yeah, you know, last time I was here, man, I said we'd have a lot to talk about. And we do indeed have a lot to talk about on the commitment front. Starting with Harbor, so they get him on campus this weekend, and it was kind of a situation where Penn State had been putting in a lot of work with Harbor behind the scenes, and he was being very receptive to what the staff was selling. He gets on campus along with Corey Smith, who we'll talk about a little bit later, makes it to campus with his Catholic Memorial teammate. And it was a situation where I I think everything was hit out of the park, and then as a result – Penn State shoots up Harbor's list to the point where he feels comfortable enough to commit. So you add a top target on the interior of the offensive line. That's where Harbor was at on the board heading into the weekend. Everything comes together for Penn State in that regard. And, I mean, really big kid. You watch the tape. He can move people around. He's a, he, uh, I, I like this get for Penn State. I think there's a lot to work with with Harbor. I, I'm interested to see where he projects in terms of, you know, left side, right side of the line. But it's all interchangeable when you're on the interior. Those, he's going to work to perfect his technique as his high school career progresses. So good get to start. And then, I mean, coming out of the weekend, man, you got Caleb Brewer and Keandre Barker. Just starting with Barker, being a top 100 guy, to get another top 100 guy, in the class after you landed Jalen Matthews in, I don't even remember when that commitment was now. It feels like so long ago that he jumped on board in that 2025 class. You had another top 100 prospect to that, and you, yeah, Penn State's really rolling along nicely in that future class. With Barker, you know, we always come back to it with the 2025 kids. You want to make sure that this is something that they really want to do before they commit, and that was a conversation that was had with James Franklin and Barker, and everything was squared away with that, so Penn State – Happy to have him on board. Really dynamic back. Has said time and time again that he's a big Saquon Barkley fan. Has long been a fan of Penn State football and the development of running backs just really throughout the program's history. So this is one of those 2025s where, yeah, there's a long way to go, but Barker's been saying all the right things. And you read into some of the feedback that has come along and where he's at in his recruitment with his mindset. It's one of the 2025s I'd say you might feel a little bit better about. You know, we'll see what transpires in that regard, but it's a good commitment. It's, it's one you want to get on board early and Penn State accomplish that. And then with Brew, Caleb Brewer from Why Missing, I'd say the way to describe him is jumbo athlete. <laughs> that, that's that's the term we've been tossing around since his commitment. Does a lot of good things on the offensive line, defensive line. I mean, he's just really, he's just really impressive athlete, man. I mean, going back to the winter, or I'm not even before then he pinned Javen Williams in 15 seconds on the wrestling mat. I, I mean, that, that alone, that speaks to the athleticism and the strength and just overall what Brewer's athletic profile is like. So three commitments coming out of this weekend so far, you know, there, there's still some things churning behind the scenes. So we'll see what comes about on that front, but Penn State off to a pretty good start coming out of blue white weekend. Yeah, I put you on the spot last Thursday, made made you answer the over-under question oh, with yeah. basketball and football, three and a half. I don't think anybody paid attention to that. No one noticed or held it held it against you when, when they got through Sunday with two. But now three on board come Tuesday afternoon. Uh, nothing on the basketball front quite yet. As I said, we'll talk about uh, that roster build in a little while with Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallon. But let's go one by one with those additions. You did a nice job laying out 
the three who've committed to Penn State since Saturday. And circle back to the guy who came on board this afternoon in Donovan Harbor, a top 24-7 prospect, considered the number one overall recruit in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, much like Javen Williams, who you just referenced, uh, and in Alex Birchmeyer, he, he's, he's got success outside of football, a uh, big-time thrower uh, in the track and field circuit as well, uh, all state honors on the football field, and a guy who was the conference lineman of the year last season. And with Harbor, uh, look, he's in the top 200, a uh, top overall interior offensive lineman, a guy who's been in communication with Phil Troutwine for about a year. I think there's just about a, a full year on the calendar from the offer – the commitment, but it felt like this one became a sprint to the finish line uh, in terms of the pace of this entire recruitment process between Harbor and Penn State. Can you talk us through that? It definitely came together quickly from the point where Harbor was seriously considering Penn State to the point where he was ready to commit. And I, I really can't overstate. I really think this Blue White weekend visit was – it goes down as the weekend that sold Donovan Harbor on Penn State – as the place to, for him because he hadn't really been around the program all that much leading up to the weekend. Yes, he was in contact with the Penn State staff for a very long time. And he was a name we didn't really discuss all that much because he hadn't been to campus. You know, we had Grant Bricks get to campus recently from Iowa, the all top 24-7 tackle. He was a guy we weren't really touching on a lot because he wasn't on campus for visits you don't know how he's going to mesh with the staff and gel with the overall fit of the program. Harbor fell into the same category, and then he gets to campus for Blue White Weekend, and things just really fell into place in multiple fronts. You know, the staff liked what Harbor was about. Harbor liked what the staff was about. So it it happened on an accelerated timeline for sure. I'm not necessarily sure Harbor arrived at Penn State this weekend thinking, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to commit if all goes well here. I think he had to see certain things, as did the staff, and it worked out for both parties. But, yeah, definitely one of those recruitments where things came together on an accelerated timeline for sure. He's listed six foot three, 310 pounds at 24-7 sports, which is the has him as the number seven overall interior offensive lineman, number 155 overall. And when we look at Caleb Brewer now, we're talking about a three-star prospect and a guy you are labeling a jumbo athlete. We're going to break down where things are with the offensive line recruiting class for 2024 in a second, but talk about the variables in play because you're not qualifying Brewer as he's an offensive lineman come enrollment. You're talking about some open doors, some different pathways to playing time that Penn State has potentially presented here. What are we talking about with a guy who's listed six foot four, 275 pounds out of the same high school that produced Javen Williams, the freshman offensive tackle? Why am I missing? I think it's one of those recruitments where, from a Penn State perspective, you kind of get them on board because you like the athletic profile, you like the ceiling, you, you like the intangibles, you like the kid for who he is as a kid. You get them on board and then you kind of figure things out later and figure things out. Maybe really, even before he makes it to campus, depending on how his senior year at Why Missing goes, you know, we always see new developments on the development front as guys go through their senior year. You know, certain things change. They prioritize certain things. Their skill set either expands in one way or the other. So there's a lot that goes into it, and you get them on board, and you work through that throughout the process. But, you know, offensive line-wise, if that's where he winds up playing, I could see him on the interior. Defensive line, likewise, I would see him on the interior there as well. He's sitting at 275 right now. You know, he's going to continue to add weight and bulk up. And I think given the athletic profile where it's at right now, I think he's in a position to add some pretty good weight and maintain the athleticism that Penn State loves that he has. And it's just a recruitment where it's an in-state recruitment, obviously. And, you know, James Franklin, what's the priority? You want to keep the best players in Pennsylvania in Pennsylvania. That's the staff's philosophy. Michigan was pushing really hard for Brewer. He got to that point, and Penn State gave him the green light. He was ready to go. He told me, look, man, I didn't want to wait anymore. I just, I wanted to, I knew where I wanted to be. And that was Penn State. And I just wanted to wrap things up. So now that he's on board, now it's time for Penn State to figure out what exactly the plan is moving forward. But they're happy to have him on. Yeah, he's another guy who can throw the discus, throw the shot put, and, and also get after it on the wrestling mat. Does a lot on the athletic spectrum. Uh, but here for Penn State football, like like you've just said, some interesting variables in play here with him. Uh, the plan, according to Brian Doan's commitment story from Saturday, is for him to make that full-time transition to offensive tackle here as a senior. He's placed in tight end in the past, uh, going to keep his hand in the dirt, uh, be an offensive lineman, going to play both sides of the ball in the trenches 
Uh, but we'll see. Uh, kind of qualify, uh, uh, categorize him perhaps with a guy like Luke Reynolds uh, from Cheshire Academy up in Connecticut, who's committed to this program. I think he's right now their lowest rated recruit, which is, says a lot about where the 2024 20, recruiting class is right now. But I think he's their lowest rated composite recruit. Big part of that, though, is he played quarterback last year and he's going to play tight end at the college level. So remember, you're taking some commitments right now and you're and we're reviewing some prospect profiles right now that remain incomplete. We'll get a better sense as these guys get to campus, go through some summer work in front of their position coaches here at Penn State. And also as they put some tape together as seniors, really focusing in on new roles that we think are going to be their eventual roles here in Happy Valley. So some things to keep in there with Brewer. So with the offensive line right now, we'll get to Barker and, and then some running back trends in a moment. But with that offensive line, where are they in terms of numbers? Where do they want to add talent? Because this is a group that's taking up a significant portion of the 2024 class right now. So we've been hearing five really throughout the cycle. And with the breakdown of that being likely to be three tackles and two interior guys. And I don't think Brewer's really included in that count right now. Because like I said, he's more of an athlete profile from a commitment standpoint. When it comes to the current, I would say the trajectory of where things are heading with this class in terms of numbers. You got two interior guys on board now in Cooper Cousins and Donovan Harbor. There's a possibility for a third addition on the interior. William Satteroy, as far as we know, still has a spot in the class. He didn't commit this weekend. He's going to go through the, the official visit process in June. Told me before the senior season, maybe August, he could come to a decision. He's going to have a spot, but it's, it's worth acknowledging that numbers when it comes to the interior linemen, they're scarce right now. Because we've been hearing two for months, and now they're at two. But it looks like the door's open for a third interior guy. And that would push the total number of linemen in this class to six, which is a bigger offensive line class. Yes, it is. And when it comes to tackle, two guys I'm really keeping a close eye on right now, names we've touched on plenty before, Kevin Haywood and Garrett Sexton. Starting with Haywood, you know, <laughs> he's had a hell of a spring, man. He's been really busy on the visit front. He's going to end the month visiting Rutgers. He's got his junior prom coming up this weekend, so he's going to get a little bit of a breather. He's, he's not going to be anywhere. He's going to get to enjoy himself a little bit before heading back out on the trail. Going to go to Rutgers, set the official visit schedule from there. At least that's the plan right now. I mean, I've been asking around on Haywood, and he, it seemed like he was close this weekend. You know, I, I, There's been a lot of due diligence in his process. Kevin, the Haywood family, the whole camp, they've been very – focused on making sure it's a well-informed decision, one where all of the variables are explored. So when you get to campus, you know exactly what's in store for you. So I, I think that played into this recruitment continuing to carry on. I, I think there's still more exploring that to be done. But Penn State feels good about where it's at with Haywood. It's felt good about where it's at with Haywood for months now. And it's going to continue to feel good, barring a pretty big change. We, I feel good about my crystal ball pick, the crystal ball Still reads 100% in favor of the Nittany Lions, so we'll be keeping an eye on him moving forward. But a lot of positives coming out of that visit. And then for Sexton, he wasn't a blue-white weekend visitor. He got on campus earlier than that for his unofficial visit. Has been really liking the way the Penn State staff has been recruiting him. Good relationship with offensive line coach Phil Trotwine. Good relationship with James Franklin. So a lot coming together there for Penn State. But one thing I will say is I want to see what comes of his Oklahoma unofficial visit before he announces his commitment on May 1st. That's one I've been told to keep an eye on. I think uh, how that visit goes will play a very big part in the way Sexton's recruitment ends up. I think Penn State will definitely have the opportunity to withstand a really strong visit from Oklahoma. I I'm not saying that if Oklahoma, if all goes well on that front, Penn State's out of the picture. By no means is that the case, but it tightens things up if he has a really good visit to Oklahoma. It gives him a little bit more to think about. So I'm going to be eyeing some feedback coming out of that visit. But right now, Sexton's crystal ball, another situation where it reads 100% in favor of the Nittany Lions. I don't have a pick in yet. I'm trending towards that. But again, really want to see what comes out of that Oklahoma visit first. That's going to be an important one for him. Well, that could potentially mean if Sexton were to end up in this class, that Penn State pulls in the top two offensive line prospects out of the state of Wisconsin, which would be something. And when you look at that group uh, that you just mentioned, Sexton, 
very compelling. Six foot seven, right around 250 pounds right now as a tackle prospect. He's a three star in the composite. Haywood and Satterwhite, both four star composite prospects. Haywood, an in state standout, one of the top 10 players in the state of Pennsylvania, a six foot seven, 290 pound tackle. And then Satterwhite, who you mentioned a few times there, also on campus this past weekend, 6'3, 290 pounds out of uh, Akron, Ohio, powerhouse Archbishop Hoban, where he is a four star guard prospect. And just quickly talking about the offensive line numbers and, 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 and what you're coming off of. You got a five man class here in, in 2023 that they are really liking. Uh, Chim Diono, of course, is going to add to this group. I should say a four man class. Chim Diono is the man coming. They've already got three on campus with Anthony Donka, who's on the interior, two tackles as of now with Birchmeyer and Javen Williams. But let's remember that group followed up uh, some lighter classes. You had just v uh, Venga Ioane and Drew Shelton out of that last 2021, uh, 2022 freshman class. And then the year before, only Landon Tangwall out of that 2021 offensive line recruiting class. So you're playing catch up a little bit and trying to backfill. You've had some Juco additions, some transfer pickups, but just some things to keep in mind there as Penn State builds another, what has the makings to be a strong offensive line haul. Let's talk about running back as Jaywan Sider has been putting in that work. And, and we just talked about Barker. Barker's highlights are a lot of fun. He's a guy who got it done on the fields of Arkansas last year. He was the number one player in that state before he transferred to the Woodlands High School in Texas was on campus, as you said, came through with that commitment. He has spoken on the record with just about anyone who would talk to him since Penn State offered a while back that Saquon Barkley is his longtime idol at running back. He'll have a chance, it seems, to live out that dream in Happy Valley like number 26 did. Break down this one, and then let's talk about Jay Wan Sider, what else he's looking to accomplish, because he just came off the Quentin Martin recruitment. What's still hanging in the balance? And you know I'm talking about Smith. Yeah. So, I mean, Barker's recruitment – we talked about Donovan Harbor on an accelerated timeline. Barker's recruitment was kind of accelerated in a similar sense, not as accelerated because we were, we were anticipating this one for about a month, but he kind of popped onto the radar heavy in early March. And I, I didn't want to really get into this until he committed, but I mean, he pretty much told us in early March to crystal ball him, the Penn state. That's how good. He did. He felt. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how good he felt about, you know, the way things are trending with Penn state and the upcoming visit that he had set to uh, make it to state college because he was originally going to be in town on April 8th leading up to blue white weekend, scratch that decided, Hey, I'm going to come for the spring game and things just really fell into place. Like I said, had the conversation where, you know, is, are you hundred percent sure that you're ready? Because that, that's a big thing for the staff. They want to make sure kids are ready. They make sure they want to make sure guys don't rush into anything. Cause likewise, they understand how important of a process this is for kids. And they want to make sure they're making the right decision for themselves and their family. And it's not a rush decision. So when they got the feeling from Barker that he was for real and ready, door was always open for him. And, it, you know, Shaywan Sider, this is a nice little birthday present for him. This came together on his birthday on Sunday. And, I mean, when you could add a back of this quality so early in the cycle, and, yeah, it'll probably be somewhat of a fight to keep him on board, but that's a fight, and that's a battle you want to take part in. You know, he's a high-quality back. I mean, you go watch his tape. This is going to be his first year. Playing in Texas, his junior season at the Woodlands is going to be his first. He played his first two seasons at Arkansas in Arkansas. And you go look at some of his tape. I mean, his ability to change direction and just make cuts, it, it's already at an elite level. And if he replicates what he was able to accomplish against Arkansas competition, against high-level Texas competition, I mean, you're talking about a guy who's already in the top 100 who's a potential riser. Right? He's already an elite prospect. We might see even more from him. Moving forward. And then Jay, getting back to Cider, what he wants to accomplish moving forward at running back, Corey Smith's the guy right now. That, that's the name that's got a lot of buzz. So he came into his weekend trip to Penn State. A lot of the intel was indicating that he was close. He was getting close to deciding if Penn State was the place for him. Things went really, really well for Smith this weekend. I, it seems like he got really close to committing at certain points. I think he held off on that for multiple reasons. And I think one of those reasons kind of came to light in the uh, Diamond Harbor's uh, Instagram live feed. He said that Smith said that he's looking to commit next week at this point. Now, now we'll see if he actually sticks to that because you know it, you, it's an Instagram live feed guys say stuff all the time. So was, we'll see what happens, but I think, you know, he and Harbor have talked about playing together. You know, and I think he maybe wants to let him have his moment a little bit. Because all that, all we've been hearing, man, it's all positives for Penn State when it comes to Corey Smith. He loves the staff. He loves Jay Wan Sider. I mean, 
he's been saying it even before he made it to campus for a visit. He felt that his best relationship with any of the schools recruiting him was with Penn State and with J1 Sider. So I think there's going to be another recruitment where the stars align and Penn State lands a really quality back to go along with Quentin Martin. He's a different skill set, a little bit smaller, you know, a little bit more of a scat back than Martin, but could do a lot of really good things. I mean, his jump cut ability is there. He's just really fluid. He's a really fluid running back. And, you know, he's going to have to bulk up a little bit, but um, that that's all part of the projection process for Penn State. You know, they're well aware of what they want out of Smith, and Smith is well aware of what Penn State wants out of him. It seems like this one's heading in the Nittany Lions' favor for sure. You've got a crystal ball pick in there, as does Steve Wolfong, director of recruiting at 24-7 Sports. And maybe the only thing better than bringing in the top player out of Wisconsin on the offensive line is having the number two player out of the state of Wisconsin, according to 24-7 Sports, at running back, following the big man to campus as well. So that's what may take shape here. Top 24-7 player by the skin of his teeth. He's number 247 is Corey Smith at the moment. Uh, and, and another name to watch here, the four-star variety for Penn State. What is What has he done in an 11-day span there, uh, tapping it off with his birthday for J1 Sider? Got Quentin Martin on board, the top player out of Pennsylvania in the 2024 cycle, a running back they've been really excited about for a long time. Got Keandre Barker. We'll see what happens this year. If those Texas schools start the chase, uh, we'll find out a lot about him. But you love the underclassmen highlights, and he's a top 100 prospect for a reason. And then kind of quietly along the way, Trey Potts comes on board to be your number three running back for the 2023 season, addressing a bit of a roster need right there that wasn't really talked about a ton, but Trey Potts just a couple weeks away. So Che Wan Slater, as Josh Pate said uh, when he was on our last episode of this podcast, uh, a bright future for him, but he has meant a lot to Penn State. Let's finish up with this before we get to Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallen. Uh, you already addressed a few of the names we wanted to talk about of on-committed guys who got the blue white. One we did not is another top 100 prospect, Benedict Ume. What do we make of his situation post-visit? So this was one of his first visits in general, really, throughout his recruitment. It's not really easy for him to get around and make visits. It's kind of difficult for him with his setup at Avon Old Farm. But he makes it to Penn State, finally makes it to Penn State. He was supposed to visit during the winter, wasn't able to make it. Earlier this spring, wasn't able to make it, unfortunately. He had a scheduling conflict there. Gets on campus for Blue White Weekend, and I would say Penn State been pretty much mission accomplished for the Penn State staff. They get him on campus. They wanted to lock down an official visit. While he was in town, they got that done. He's going to be back in June for an official. And just, I mean, Benedict Dume, from everything that I've gathered, really loved the visit and loved the people in Happy Valley and was just really appreciative of the entire weekend and the way Penn State put everything together for him. And he's been very receptive to Penn State's recruiting efforts throughout the cycle. And getting him back on campus, you know, for an extended stay, given, you know, the difficulties that he's had with travel before, that's huge because it gives you an extended opportunity to sell him on the depths of the program. And that's a big deal for Ume because he's a big academic kid. He's looking for a lot more than just football and NIL and all that stuff. He's really into the academic side of things, the, just the overall experience and the institution. So that's going to be what he's going to be looking for when he gets back for his official visit in June. But yeah, of all the visits that took place this weekend that didn't result in a commitment, what Penn State was able to accomplish for Benedict Gume was one of the more impressive things of the weekend. Yeah, follow-up official visit. Very important at this stage as those continue to get set up for, for the month of June. Two things. You mentioned the high-level academics. He has the Stanford uh, Stanford offer in hand. He has visited Stanford. Stanford was the only other school that hosted in this spring. We talked about it. If you see a Stanford offer on someone's profile, yep. just take note of it. You don't even need to see their transcript. It's really, really good. And then this is an Ontario native. He's from the Toronto area. If anyone's done well with Canadian recruits over the years and, and, and laid some groundwork and some buzz in that region, it's certainly the Nittany Lions at the Power 5 level. So a couple things to keep in mind there with Benedict Dume, who, as you said, returning in the summer. Uh, last thing for you here, that one door closes, another opens. We're done with the spring practice phase of the recruiting cycle. What's the next phase that people need to be aware of? Because we still got a, a little while ago before prospect camps return to campus. Definitely a couple aspects. You know, the coaches are going to start hitting the road soon, getting out to see some of its top targets. You know, they're going to decompress a little bit coming out of spring ball. And then it's it's back to full speed for the staff on the recruiting show. They're going to be getting out, 
checking in with guys. So that's going to be something to monitor. We're going to have plenty of, you know, updates on that activity on lines 24 seven, because those guys are going to be all over the place. They're going to be all over, all over the place often. And it provides, you know, more insight into who the top guys on the board truly are. Cause you're not at the point in the cycle where you're wasting time for visiting guys you're iffy on there. You know, you know who you want and that's who the staff is going to go visit. That, that's really just the facts of it. And then, you know, you're going to work as a staff to continue to lock down your June official visit slate. A lot of it is already in place, but there are guys, you know, Penn State is still working to get on campus for officials. So that's going to be pretty much another objective for the staff. And then, you know, you mentioned camp season. That, that's also a part of it. You're going to spend these months coming out of spring ball, figuring out what guys you want to camp, whether it be 2024s, 2025s, 26s. You're going to figure out who you want to get back on campus to get a better look at. You're going to see if you can make that happen. And, you know, with 20, when it comes to the current class and camp season, there's always the possibility for a guy to get on campus and blow the staff away. Yazid Haynes did that last summer. Obviously, he wound up at Georgia and not Penn State after being commit committed to the Nittany Lions. For I a almost forgot spell. all about Yazid Haynes. I yeah, almost it, forgot about him. It's, wow. been, it's been a while, man. And he was on board for such a short period of time that it's pretty easy to get to that point. But you never know what's going to come about from camp season. Sure, camp season, a lot of the emphasis is always on the underclassmen and who really bursts onto the radar and earns an offer. But there's still plenty of action that could happen with that current class as well. Well, Tyler Caparuso, great breakdown of the blue-white game feedback and beyond that. And, and of course, there's so much that we didn't even get to here that's happening over at lines247.com for our VIP subscribers with Brian Doan, Alan True, Steve Wolfong, and, of course, yourself doing a lot of heavy lifting coming out of this weekend. Things really heating up for the Penn State recruiting efforts. And, oh, by the way, looming in the backdrop of all this, the transfer portal is back open. We'll talk about that in just a minute with, with Mark and Daniel, but I know you're on top of that as well as Penn State exploring some roster additions. Tyler, we'll keep tracking your work at lines247.com. Thanks for hopping on the podcast. Thanks for having me back, man. All right, let's transition real quickly over to Daniel Gallon and Mark Brennan, psych colleagues at lines247.com. Gentlemen, uh, thanks for your patience as Tyler went through a lot of recruiting intel there. Happy to bring you on board now. Um, we're going to talk basketball, uh, though, to start out this segment. We've got blue-white game. Uh, Mark, we didn't hear from you on that in the post-game podcast. But, look, you've got Kanye Clary, Jamil Brown both confirming. They're sticking around. Clary never hopped in the portal. Brown did. Mark, uh, we didn't. We wondered if anyone will be retained from this roster. Those are two really important foundational pieces. There's some more answers to be found, but what do you think about that aspect of the roster building that the the new staff has done thus far? Mark, we can't hear you. How, how's that? Is that better? <laughs> That's much better. Yeah, it helps when you turn the microphone on. That's the, <laughs> the key to podcasting. Turn the mic on. Uh, but what I was attempting to say, it was it was amazing what I said at that portion. Uh, Kanye <laughs> Clary was a guy who, you know, what I really liked, uh, he gave them some really good minutes in the postseason. And they were not afraid to go to him, and they were even drawing some plays up for him. Good defensive player, not the biggest guy, but super athletic, and one of the few guys on last year's team who could really get to the basket. Now, he wasn't driving and dunking, but he was quick enough to, to kind of burst through the lane and, and, and create some things. Jameel Brown, I had a chance to talk to Steve Jones and Dick Girardi uh, when we were in Des Moines uh, for that shoot-around day, Daniel, when we were just kind of hanging out watching the, the team uh, shoot around the day before the uh, the first game. And, you know, I, I asked them about, I asked both of those guys because they see a lot more of the team than, than we do. And I'm like, you know, how do you really see Jameel Brown projecting? I said, is he a guy who – uh, you know, can be kind of that next sort of scoring kind of guard in a picket kind of way. And, and they said, no, he's going to be more like Andrew Funk. He really developed as a three-point shooter uh, over the course of last season, even though we really didn't see him. I mean, Funk played so many minutes. It was such an integral player that we didn't see a lot of Jameel Brown. So I think getting those two guys uh, kind of as a, as coming back from that freshman class – is going to add a little bit of uh, you know continuity. I mean, clearly they're going to lose some other guys. Uh, we'll see how things play out the next couple of weeks and the next couple of months. But I think having those two guys is kind of a base, uh, a baseline to start with is a good thing. 
And Daniel, just finishing up a, a little quick basketball segment here. We're not investing quite as much time as we had in recent weeks into the hoops team, but um, VCU transfers, Ace Baldwin, Nick Kern, officially signing with the program. That was announced Tuesday. You had an article up at lines247.com. Obviously, feel free to address the, the, the retainment of Clary and Brown, but what do you make of those guys officially jumping on board and their potential impact for the next season? Yeah, I mean, to, to start with adding uh, these two transfers from VCU, uh, I think you look at Ace Baldwin, and that is someone who comes in really, really accomplished. Um, you know, with that, with his resume and his familiarity with Mike Rhodes, uh, I think he's very poised to kind of be the guy next year, um, you know, depending on who else comes in through the portal. But yeah, I think that you look at what Ace Baldwin has been able to do uh, in college basketball. He knows Mike Rhodes. Uh, he plays strong defense. He knows the system. Um, I think that when you look at Penn State next year and you try to project it out a little bit, he's going to be where you start uh, in terms of success. Uh, Nick Kern Jr. is pretty interesting to me as well. Um, you know, he's got the length, you know, six foot six, you know, can help wreak havoc uh, in that Mike Rhodes system. Um, I'm really, really intrigued to see uh, what he looks like. He, he's a little bit of a more unknown commodity doesn't quite have the same accolades that uh, Ace Baldwin does. Um, but I think that he's someone where you bring him uh, to you know new place, but different personnel around him. Maybe his role changes a little bit. Maybe that unlocks uh, some other things for him. But, you know, I think you look at what Penn State has been able to do right now in terms of those two additions and then uh, the retention of Clary and Brown. I think that they're off to a, a pretty good start. Um, you know, Demetrius Lilly is there as well um, as someone who hasn't entered the portal and, and we haven't you know, heard anything other than then he'll be back. But um, I, I'd go off of what Mark was talking about with Jameel Brown. I, I think that he is maybe the player I'm most excited to see uh, from this freshman class uh, moving forward. Um, I think that there is a lot of talent there. Um, you know, talking to the guys in the locker room uh, when we were out in Des Moines, all of them said that he can shoot the lights out. Um, you know, he also got some, you know, some uh, credit for being a good rebounder uh, from the guard position, which is something that maybe you don't always hear about a, a, a freshman. So, you know, I'm excited to see what Jamil Brown can do. You know, like Mark said, he didn't really need to do anything last year. Um, so, of course, you know, we didn't see him, uh, you know, pretty much at all. And that necessarily wasn't his fault based on how that depth chart worked out. Um, you know, Penn State didn't really need him to do anything. Um, so I think that he and Clary are definitely poised to have, you know, roles, uh, even if you bring in guys who know Mike Rhodes' system ahead of them. Um, you know, I'd be hard pressed to see uh, Mike Rhodes kind of go in the Micah Shrewsbury route where you have your starters playing, you know, at least 32, 33, 34, 35, in some cases, 37 minutes per game. Um, so I think that that could help open up some playing time. But, you know, I think that, when you're building a program, building a team for your first year, you know, got to make some new additions, got to keep some older guys around. And I think Mike Rhodes has, has taken some good first steps, but still a long way to go. And, you know, I think that there's still what eight free scholarships, depending on what happens with the portal. So, so much, much more to happen. Yeah, it seems like a new name surfaces every day in terms of the transfer portal possibilities. It's not just the VCU guys. Uh, Temple basketball transfer Zach Hicks coming up towards the decision. We have a story up on Lines 24-7 about that with Penn State in the mix there. Going to be some new names, some new pieces. But so far, I think through three weeks, you got some stabilized uh, situation and, and you're, you're moving in the right direction compared to maybe the worst-case scenario that some people were picturing at the time of the coaching move. Mark, we'll go back to, to Saturday now in Beaver Stadium. We were all alongside each other in the press box and watching Penn State play Penn State. It was a 10 nothing Team Blue victory. Uh, Daniel and I spent 30, 40 minutes doing our post-game rendition here on Saturday evening. Curious, as we just jump into it now, what are the top things that you kind of took away walking out of the stadium that you felt you learned from the experience? The thing that I, that I always get a kick out of, out of the Blue-White game, and, and it was this year more than ever – um, yeah, I think a lot of people on our site are kind of plugged in and they know how these things kind of go. But if you just look at some social media in general, the way people were freaking out about the offense and the lack of productivity, it's like people, this is Mike Yersich could be the most paranoid coach in the world. And I mean that in a good way. He is not going to show you anything in the blue white game. 
So do not take anything out of, of what they are or will not be able to do offensively out of that blue-white game. And then I also love the fact that Manny Diaz was blitzing at points. I mean, that's just kind of the way that he's wired. But I, I wanted to just say for anybody who's really worried about the about the offense, the leading rusher in the blue-white game last year was Kevon Lee. The leading passer was Christian Veyu or Veyer or however we say his name. And the leading receiver was Jaden Dotton. Uh, so that tells you so, – so my, my point being, when you look at the blue-white game, I think it's less about the stat sheet, you know, this thing, less about the stat sheet. It's more about kind of the energy and the speed and the hitting and all of those things. And I liked all of that. I mean, I thought there was a lot of energy from both sides. I thought there was some really tough hitting. I mean, uh, that part of it was really fun. And I just, just the overall energy and vibe, I think, was really positive. Being able to talk to some of the players after the game, thought Drew Aller handled himself tremendously. The first time he's been in a post-game situation, obviously it was just a scrimmage, sitting in at that main microphone, uh, in the Beaver Stadium media room, that is not an easy thing to do. And he was a natural, wasn't he? I mean, no matter what you asked him about. So those are kind of the things that I look at. I also want to say that I was robbed and uh, and so was uh, Zariah <laughs> Fisher. I mean, it was ridiculous that they credited a sack to deny Dennis Sutton that should have been Fisher's. Now, why do I care? Because I predicted Fisher as the defensive MVP, and he would have been. He would have had five tackles, a sack, and a one and a half tackles for loss. Instead, they ripped him off. But it was actually fun to see Fisher get out there and play well because he's a guy who missed so much time last season. Uh, that was cool. And I also like the fact that Tony Rojas got a ton of snaps, which we expected. Uh, and I will give credit to whoever was picked Tony Rojas as the defensive MVP, MVP because he was out there. Uh, he was he was one of those guys flying around, hitting like crazy, just having a lot of fun, a lot of energy. And I like the fact that we got to see some of the young offensive linemen. So I'm kind of all over the place there, but those are the things that stood out to me. I'll take the credit for the Rojas pick. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I didn't hear you try to build your case for Bo Prabula as offensive MVP. You mentioned one of your of your MVP picks. I didn't hear oh, much did about Bo? Bo. I'm sorry. You did. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I would also say uh, that Deny Dennis Sutton, if he wasn't you know, close friends with the quarterback back there and if he wasn't under direct orders not to hurt that close friend of a quarterback, he may have ended up with five sacks on the day. And that's where I want to start because the depth of this Penn State defense was on display. You know, Franklin and, and kind of defending the way they split up the squads on Saturday afternoon and trying to make it competitive, he cited the safety position. He cited the defensive end position, two of the deepest on this squad where you've got Big Ten starting caliber talent on both sides, uh, uh, you know, whether they're wearing blue or wearing white on Saturday. But I come away from this thing thinking, well, Deny Dennis Sutton certainly looks like he's everything that we thought he might be in year two on campus as a former five-star. Amin Vanover remains one of the more underrated, underspoken about defensive players on this entire roster. And he kind of fell into that category last year with the way he was consistent presence at that position as a backup. But I also come away wondering where things stand with Drew Shelton and Caden Wallace because they were on the other side of that brutality on some occasions, uh, we saw Sheldon take his, take his lumps. It was our longest look at Caden Wallace since last October. Remember, he got involved with some backup reps in the Rose Bowl late. But those two are going to be under the microscope. Mark, you, you had talked about this being a really positive for the program, that these two caliber offensive linemen are, are, are competing for a starting job. Daniel, you know, is this me focusing too much on one side or the other? Is it a, is it a part of both? Because let's face it, Caden Wallace and Drew Shelton were going up against Deny Dennis Sutton, Adisa Isaac, Chop Robinson, Amin Vanover for 15 practice sessions. They told us how much they benefited from it. But we've seen a defensive end take over a game in Beaver Stadium, and it cost Penn State not too long ago. And I was just getting some shades back to that as I watched those two defensive ends have their way and keep Drew, Drew Aller on her toes on his toes, which I thought was a tremendous thing for him to take that experience. But it can't be the norm for this offense moving forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to try to pronounce JT's last name uh, in, in, in terms of your, your Beaver Stadium flashbacks. But yeah, I mean, I think that it's kind of a little bit of everything that you talked about. Like, I, I do think that part of it is going up against those defensive ends. And I think that it is those defensive ends being that good um, to, you know, to look like that. Um, I think part of it is that, you know, Caden Wallace has played heavy reps for the past three years. And I think that we kind of know what he is as a player at this point. 
Um, I think that, you know, if he takes a, a big leap uh, forward this year, that's great. But I think that you kind of know the baseline that you're going to be operating from with him as your right tackle, which, you know, there's going to be moments, uh, you know, like we saw on Saturday, um, like we saw, I think, in the the Purdue game in the season opener was was one that was pretty glaring uh, last year. Um, and then with Shelton, I think that you're kind of seeing a, some, you know, growing pains. I mean, he's still a young player. Um, he was able to do some really nice things last year. Uh, you know, playing on the right side might be a little new for him. You know, that's an adjustment. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of different things that that are involved there. You know, also with the offense being pretty vanilla um, and Mike Yersich not showing too, too much. You know, who knows what the, the blocking schemes might look like? Who knows how they might adjust? You're missing Tyler Warren and Theo Johnson, uh, two really big bodied tight ends who might be able to help the tackles in certain situations. So, you know, I think there's a lot of factors that go into it. You know, it definitely isn't necessarily the kind of lasting image you want to take away from spring practice. When you think about your, your five-star quarterback back there, you know, getting, you know, Drew Shelton pushed into his lap at times or, or things like that. But, you know, I think that we saw some good things from Aller and, you know, in response to that, where, it didn't necessarily seem like he, you know, lost his head uh, when when the pocket started to collapse. You know, he's able to navigate it well. He seemed calm. Uh, seemed like he had his eyes downfield. Um, so I think it's a little bit of everything. You know, I think that there is maybe a little bit reason for concern, but at the same time, I think that you know, you know, what you have in Caden Wallace and Drew Shelton, still a pretty young player. You know, so let's see where we go from now to September. And they, everyone likes to apply that phrase, iron shape, sharpens iron. Every coach will tell us that. Every player will tell us that when these guys are working, whether it's offensive tackle versus defensive end or wide receiver versus cornerback. But maybe there's some days, and we saw one of them where it looked more like a hammer and a nail in, in, in situations between those two sides. And, and perhaps there were other days on the spring practice field where those two guys uh, had their way with some of those defensive ends. But re- let's remember, Olu Fashinu not on the field for this one. want to reiterate, we saw him at every practice session that was open to us during the spring as the starting left tackle. One a note on him uh, that we learned today uh, from an event that, that Penn State had with student athletes and, and uh, acknowledging some of the act- academic success across the athletic department. Olu Fashinu, not only does he probably have the highest grade for the 2024 draft down in this roster. He also has the highest cumulative GPA in year four on campus. So really impressive. Uh, Sticking at the tackle position, they're down one, by the way, before we move on. Uh, Jimmy Christ was the first name to surface in this post-spring practice transfer portal window that is much shorter than the postseason one we saw in December and January. It's about two weeks here. But Chris uh, was in year four. He was part of that rather large 2020 uh, offensive line class that included Nick Dawkins, Ibrahim Traore, Golden Israel Achumba, and, of course, Olu Fashinu. To this point, Fashinu is the one who's emerged as a starter. Nick Dawkins has broken through on the two deep, it seems, at center. Uh, right now, a lot to learn about the other guys. And, and, and Chris going to be trying uh, to sort things out elsewhere. Mark, that leads me to believe that when you're looking for a fourth tackle – and James Franklin told us a couple times during spring ball that was a point of emphasis for him. They want to get make sure they have a game-ready fourth offensive tackle and maybe reading between the lines and hearing that, knowing there's a fourth-year guy who's played in Big Ten matchups and Jimmy Crist, maybe you could have projected this coming with him leaving the program. But Alex Birchmeyer has been getting reps on the right side. He also has been playing some guard. Javen Williams has been getting reps on the left side. and The athleticism really stands out there. Uh, and Jim Ono comes to campus. But I think you're looking at a spot where – Things go according to plan. You're not going to have to play this guy much, but maybe that Drew Shelton path that you had last year, Mark, and, and Olu gets hurt and that, that path gets changed. But whether it's Birchmeyer or Javen Williams, where you've got that true freshman offensive tackle waiting in the wings, get him to four games. If you have to, get him more. But that's really what the scenario is right now for them at offensive tackle, unless we see a guy like J.B. Nelson kick out and step up on the perimeter. Yeah, I think J.B. Nelson, you know, he might be the guy that they actually play more but maybe doesn't have the upside of some of the younger guys as they've tried to preserve red shirts. I think the really good thing is they have um, a, 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 a large group. I mean, that's really not the best way to put it, but they have, they have a nice pool of players there to choose from. So when, unlike, you know, last year where really uh, at tackle, if it wasn't Shelton stepping up, who was it going to be? 
you know, Venga, I think, is clearly more of an interior type offensive lineman. So I think the positive is that you have, a, you know, that those three three different players who all uh, James Franklin has said uh, have the opportunity to who could who could play tackle. I mean, Birchmeyer, I think they they think they could put just about anywhere. Uh, but having that pool of players, I, I think, uh, is, is is a positive. Also, you know, I think if you're in Jimmy Christ's shoes, and once Drew Shelton passes you on the depth chart last year, that's you're kind of reading the writing on the wall. And I think it was probably good for him that they were able to get those three offensive linemen in at the midway point and as early enrollees. So he knew where he stood. And I don't think he's entering the portal if he thinks he's going to be that fourth guy. Uh, and so the be- best of luck to him. We've seen a lot of players from Penn State the last few years uh, knock down maybe a level, you know, go down a little bit of a level and, and, and find their spot there. And I think that's what you're going to see from Jimmy Christ. I think he's going to find a home at, at a slightly lower level than Penn State, whether that's, you know, uh, mid-major, whatever it may be. I think that would probably be more fitting. Not an insult to him. I think more of, an, of, a, of a compliment to the way that they've been recruiting on the offensive line the last few years. And, and also another former Nittany Lion, and, and now Jimmy Chris falls into that category, Marquise Wilson, uh, who played a lot of cornerback last year after his odyssey in the receiver room in 2021, uh, now surfacing with another Big Ten program. Uh, confirmation coming uh, today that he is going to be heading over to Purdue, continuing his career with the Boilermakers. And that's a guy who's clearly a Big Ten caliber cornerback. He made some big plays here as a true freshman, burning his red shirt, came up with a big interception in the Cotton Bowl and, and ended up repping a lot at the position. But goes to show about the secondary, Daniel, and I think that was fully on display. I said you've got two starting caliber safeties, no matter which side of the scrimmage you're looking at. And you can certainly say the same about cornerback. And you can probably say you've got a really good three deep at cornerback on both sides of the ball if you wanted to really split it up and, and, and get down to business with this group. Manny Diaz has a lot cooking back there. Anthony Poindexter, Terry Smith, tremendous minds working in that backfield. And to me, this is far and away. And, and this is saying a lot because of the talent they've had the last couple of years there. But from top to bottom, when you can go 10, 12 guys on a list, it's the most impressive secondary unit I've seen Penn State assemble in the six years I've been covering this team. When I was going through uh, the, the cornerback depth chart for the the Mar- Marquise Wilson post today, you know, looking at what they had last year because they had that top five group, um, and you subtract two guys from that group in Joey Porter and Marquise Wilson. So you bring back Kalen King, Johnny Dixon, Daquan Hardy, but then you add Storm Duck to that group and you bump Cam Miller into it. And, you know, you're losing a, a first round pick in in Porter and then someone, you know, in Wilson who is experienced, athletic um, and, and fast. But you still look at that group and you still feel really, really good about it um, and, and what it'll be able to do. So, you know, and then on top of that, I think you can maybe factor in Elliot Washington as as the sixth man um, in that cornerback room based on you know what he's shown uh, physically and, and what his teammates have said about him. Uh, this spring so yeah, I think that secondary it's just going to be a lot of fun uh, to see what Terry Smith and Anthony Poindexter do you know what Manny Diaz comes up with to get as many players as many of those players uh, onto the field as possible um, I think the one disappointment from the the spring game in terms of things that you wanted to see to get a little bit of insight into that is we didn't see the prowler package uh, so, you know, we don't know, or at least I don't think we did. <laughs> um, so you know, we don't know who is stepping up into that, you know, Jair Brown role close to the close to the line of scrimmage, you know, which safeties are getting onto the field and, and which situations. Um, so I think that that group it just really has a lot of different possibilities. It has a lot of talent uh, and it's just a really real testament to the work that, you know, Anthony Poindexter and, and Terry Smith has have done. Um, and especially with Terry Smith, you, know, you, you and Tyler Calvaruso have talked about it uh, on the, the podcast recently, too. You know, when you look into this defensive backfield next year, the year after and beyond kind of what Penn State has coming down the pike, uh, it's a very, very impressive group.
And let's remember Terry Smith uh, recruited and coached for a couple of years. Keaton Ellis, who's now your defensive team captain at the safety spot. And uh, Jalen Reed was missing from action on Saturday. We went through a lot of those guys who were missing uh, on our post-game podcast. But you had Makai Flowers step up into one of those starting positions in the scrimmage action. And he's a guy that you know can be out of sight, out of mind when you work your way through this defensive backfield. I thought he flashed occasionally as well. But they do think, I think this staff believes they have – three NFL draft picks next year at the cornerback position and maybe the top overall prospect at that position. So it speaks volumes when you've got that at the top and then you've got this bubbling group of young talent, whether it's a second year player like Cam Miller or an early enrollee like Elliot Washington doing some things. And Mark, I want to open the door for you to comment on some of those defenders as we talk about the depth there that jumped out to you. Some guys that we talked about after that, that maybe weren't as, uh, you know, aren't penciled in as starters right now. K.J. Winston, uh, I think he validated a lot of the spring hype in the spring game. I thought Tamir Robinson, you talked about Tony Rojas, but Tamir Robinson looked a lot more comfortable at linebacker at this stage of his college career, especially when you consider something he tweeted today on a Tuesday. This was his first time suiting up for a quote-unquote game in 18 months because of injuries he was dealing with coming out of his high school career. So just a few guys that popped up to us that we talked about on Saturday. You can take it there and, and, and take it wherever you want. Yeah, I mean, I think both of the linebackers, obviously, for those guys to come in and get all the reps that they were able to get, uh, given who wasn't there, uh, Dom DeLuca and Elston, I mean, both of those guys, you figure, are going to give them, uh, you know, significant minutes. Uh, But I think they were really able to take advantage of that. The the hype about Rojas, it it looks legit. I don't know that he's he's not necessarily a plug-and-play guy, but I think to come through and do what he did uh, in that game, I really liked. And then K.J. Winston, uh, everybody's been raving about him all spring. And he just, again, I, I think it's pretty cool when you get into these games and you're not going to see as much uh, of the star power. You know, you're not going to see Abdul Carter get making 10 tackles. I think he had one tackle. That's not what you want out of these games as, as a media person or as a fan. You want to see what some of these younger players uh, are all about. And I think those guys, in in all seriousness, I thought Fisher, that was really good to see because after everything that he went through last year, we thought he was going to be out for the year. James Franklin said he was done for the year. He was able to come back very late in the season and and see a couple snaps against Rutgers and a couple snaps against Maryland. Uh, But then to go out there and log a bunch of football on uh, in the, in the blue white game uh, to me, that's good. That was really good. Uh, was surprised Smith Vilbert, not sure what, what's going on with that situation. So to have a guy like Fisher, it wasn't a bowl up, game. If it's not a bowl game, I guess, you know, it's... yeah, but I think, you know, in all seriousness, it, it, it almost seems as if that's more of a question mark than maybe we anticipated it being. And to have a guy like Fisher step up and get it done. And I'm kind of just going down, looking at the stats. Cam Miller is a guy, uh, you know, you touched on, and I think he's clearly fitting in there at cornerback. Uh, Storm Duck, uh, did, did he have was the PI on Storm Duck? I, I think it might have been, uh, but he was out there and he looked like he fit right in. So again, it's very hard uh, w- when you're talking about. If we go back to the offensive tackles a little bit, they are so limited in what they're doing offensively that it's very hard to to to, to make sweeping generalizations. But I think with some of those younger players, just kind of the again seeing how they fit in out there in that sort of game in front of that sort of crowd, kind of getting the job done. I just thought a bunch of those younger guys uh, look good to me. Yeah, and I, I, just a couple other guys in the trenches, younger players still, although Landon Tengwall is not so young anymore. They're both year three players, actually. And, and I thought Tengwall, you know, getting our longest look at him since – last October before the bye week against Northwestern when he went and he went down. So I, I thought that he looked like he's trending in the right direction. I thought he, I thought he looked a lot like himself and he's a guy I thought was going to be playing some really good football during the second half of last season. It ended up opening the door for Hunter Norzad to play some really good football, although he was kind of bumped and bruised over the course of that 2022 season. And then on the other side, uh, Davon Townley, I uh, know not, not, putting him in the conversation to be a September guy, October guy, or even a 2023 guy in the conversation about rotational components for the defensive line. But there was a surge there in a couple of plays that I know Daniel and I commented to to each other, a lot of raw, a a lot of raw technique out there. He's kind of just, again, a lot of North South movement out there, but I think as he puts it together, learns how to rush the passer from inside, which is, you know, you feel caged in. It's not normal when you spend your football career to this point 
rushing with you know a lineman to your left and no one to your right and, and, and you have that freedom and movement you don't have that anymore but I thought Townley did some things in the field that 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 flashed enough to give you an indication that that it's more than just adding pounds right now he's a guy that's adding some some things to his toolbox and I, I said when he came back in, in late January or whenever that was pulled his name out of the portal that was a significant roster addition because it's the kind of piece that you want to have. You don't need every single piece in your defensive line room to be producing on Saturdays, but you need some pieces that are cooking for next year or cooking for when someone goes down ahead of them. And I think they may have one of those in Townley. Daniel, anything to kind of uh, jump into here while we do some review? No, I, I think Townley is a really, really good one to to highlight um, just in terms of you can see the the physical difference, but the fact even with that, you're still seeing that kind of, pass rush technique you know you're still seeing the the flashes on the interior um i think that bodes pretty well for him <clears throat> even even if we're not sure that he's a 2023 player yet you know he's still this still might be a 2024 thing um in the end but yeah i think that overall i think townley was someone who stood out to me physically on defense you know you touched on tamir robinson uh just the the way that he was able to move uh, and just how big and long he looks in the middle of that defense. You contrast it with when we were seeing that blue team defense on the field and, you know, Kobe King in the middle, you know, what we saw from Tyler Elsden last year, those are more kind of compact guys, not small by any means, but, you know, Tamir Robinson just looks like someone completely different uh, in the middle of that defense, which, you know, depending on how his trajectory goes, you know, your, your mind can start to to run a little bit when you think of the possibilities there. Um, with, with what he could do if he sticks at the mic. Um, but, you know, I think that you know, coming out of it, those were two of the guys that, you know, who knows what kind of impact they will make uh, in 2023. But I think that, you know, in terms of learning about guys in spring and, you know, really being able to take something out of it, those were two who, who really stood out to me. And if there was some pointed criticism, and let's get into our lingering questions, gentlemen, coming out of spring ball is uh, we won't see this team in pads again until August. And and James Franklin went right at that punting unit, uh, which wasn't much of a unit. He was talking about, you know, not dealing with any any rush and, and just punting the ball freely in front of a crowd in Beaver Stadium. He did not think that he was getting what he wanted out of that spot. And he, he wasn't, if you watch those, those punts. Uh, and, and that's an area where... Penn State's been able to hang their hat and kind of know what they're getting for, what, seven years now, it seems, going back to Blake Gillikin's freshman year. You know you're going to have some reliability there. And Look, Riley Thompson, they gave a scholarship to him for a reason when he did at FAU. They gave Alex Paquetta a scholarship a couple of years ago coming in. Now he's uh, now he's a redshirt freshman. Uh, but this is a spot where if you can have a 12-man presence at the punter for your defense, knowing what the defense can do, that's going to go a long way. We saw Falcons kick twice, uh, I think a 22-yarder, 28-yarder field goal, an extra point. We did not see Sanders Sahedak attempt a kick during the blue-white game. We saw both of them uh, you know, bombing some longer kicks during pregame. Like our practice views, that's been a little hit or miss. Um, so I'm just going to categorize special teams, those open jobs, but specifically place kicker and punter as really standout lingering questions because we know Penn State has a good chance to win eight, nine of their games by a significant margin. There's a couple of these games where we know if they win, it's going to take five, six point kind of spread. And when we're talking about field position and putting points on the board, that can doom you if you don't have it right. Yeah, I mean, listen, one other thing that kind of stood out to me or that didn't stand out to me, I guess, I was a little surprised we didn't see more of Jackson Smolik. Um, you know, he's one pass third. attempt. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know. I'm trying to figure out. I mean, he he, he had the, it was it was a, a bad snap from Nick Dawkins that he was unable. It was a little low. He probably should have caught it. I went back and looked at it several times. Uh, BTN only showed it once. They didn't show a replay. Uh, but I don't know if that was punishment for not fielding the snap or, or what was going on there. But you would think that you would want your third team quarterback to have had a little bit more action in front of that sort of crowd, you know, knock on wood that you're not going to rely on him when the season gets here, but you just never know. And listen, um, I, I was, uh, again, I know there are only so many snaps and you have a running clock and they wanted to get Bo Pribula work. Uh, I, I get all of that, but I, I was thinking we would see at least one series in the second half. And, and, and the fact that we didn't, 
you know, I think that's a little bit, it's not as big an area of concern, obviously, as punter. I mean, the thing about punter is, you know, kind of going off on that tangent, you have two scholarships wrapped up in punter. You better have a, a damn good punter. I mean, that's, that, that is a lot of scholarship capital uh, wrapped up in punter. So somebody better rise to the surface there. But getting back to the QB situation would not make too much of, of Bo Pribula being, I think, what was it, 10 of 27 or something like that, 10 of 30. Um, his game, and you had mentioned it, uh, at, it when, when we talked before the blue white game, Tyler, and it was a good point that I didn't really take into account that his mobility is really hindered in that sort of game because you only have to be tagged to be down. So I'm not saying that, that he's, uh, you know, he answered every single question. There's still a lot of question marks there about Bo. But in terms of that third team QB, would have liked to see him get some more action in that game just to see what he's all about and see how he handles that the, kind of the crowd. I mean, to go out there, uh, hand it off once, you know, not feel the snap and then throw a, 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 a pass that in a very difficult, uh, I think, third and 21 or something like that, would have liked to see more out of Jackson. And, and somehow James Franklin gets out of this post-game press conference without being asked who his starting quarterback is or if he's named yeah, I know how. Ready, ready to name a starting quarterback. So uh, James Franklin, I'll be just fine with that. And we're going to have no answer there for a, a little while longer and perhaps into preseason camp, perhaps deep in a preseason camp. But I think those of us who watch this, this team, uh, those of us who've seen Drew Aller in action before, it, it's hard not to put your eggs in, in one particular basket yeah. here, even though it's only mid April. Um, I just want to make a point here. We didn't ignore wide receiver. We covered it a lot in the postgame podcast because of what Omari Evans did, what Caden Saunders stepped up and was able to do, what Anthony Ivey was able to do. Tyler Johnson got involved. You saw Malik McLean involved early. Uh, a lot of names there. Omari Evans is a guy that we've written about a lot on the site. Um, so, so just wanted to make sure that people didn't think we were ignoring that storyline as well because that's an important one to follow uh, with Dante Cephas coming in and James Franklin referencing maybe another transfer portal interest that they've already brought in too at that position fellows i think that's going to do it for this episode thank you so much for contributing everything from the blue white game and uh, a lot more from what we talked about over at lines 247.com on a tech side mark has a bunch of takeaways uh daniel has a write-up on what's next for drew aller heading into the summer on omari evans emerging that receiver and we'll have a ton more coming up as in the days to follow here as we empty our notebook from spring ball thanks guys yep thanks tyler all right, good stuff from Mark Brennan, uh, Daniel Gallon, and Tyler Calvaruso, my teammates at Lions247.com. Uh, we're going to call that a show for now. Step aside. We'll be back a little bit later in the week to discuss whatever else happens in the Penn State universe, along with breaking some stuff down with some favorite guests. For now, I'm Tyler Donahue. We'll be, real we'll be back real soon on the Lions 24-7 podcast.